Okay, today's we're getting into property types. Which ones are we going to target and which one are we going to stay well, well away from? Today's really to make sure you're gonna walk away with clarity, understanding which assets to target, why you're targeting them and what you're going to do to use and build your strategy around. So we'll get straight into it. We're gonna get into the first, and this is why, why most properties are off the menu. And the first one we're looking at here is apartments. So I've made some content on this one before, but firstly, apartments, they've got really poor land to asset value. Um, you've essentially got no parcel of land. Uh, and they don't really offer a lot of value add potential. You know, <laughs> excluding an internal reno, you're not doing a subdivision, you're not adding any bedrooms, you're not subdividing, you're not doing anything of that nature when it comes to apartments. And they also come with heavy body corporate fees. So you don't even have the benefit of avoiding, you know, you do you are gonna get less council rates because you don't have that strong land component. Well, your body corporates come straight in and they start charging you exorbitant fees because you've got access to the swimming pool, which you never use, and the uh, tennis court you never use anyway. So, and that eats into your cash flow. There's, you're not in charge of your asset either. So you're not ultimately going to be determined, you're gonna to need to get approval um, of what you can and can't do on that asset as well. You've always got the threat of oversupply it's very, very common when you're getting into apartments that these apartments, they build one complex across the road, there's 500 apartments in it. Your apartment complex is maybe five or 10 years old now. Everything's starting to look a little bit dated, just like fashion, just like that, your apartment complex is no longer desired. It's hard, the value comes down or just stays suppressed and so do your rental returns. You will find most apartments actually get outperformed by inflation. So the typical growth rate's about two to 3%. I've used this example many times before, but I actually have a real life client example where they bought two properties in Melbourne. One was a brand new build in an apartment, I think it was in the suburb of Ramon or Richmond, and they bought a property in Listerfield, four bedroom home out there, around about the exact same year timeline, uh, around about five or 10K difference in price. The Apartment in today's dollars is in the low to mid $700,000 price range, yet the home they're living in is closer to $2.5 million. So for me, the number one no-go is apartments, number one. Nothing really beats the apartments. Then we move into units. So more talk, there's obviously different types of units. You've got your unit blocks, which there may be 20, 40, whatever it may be in terms of units on that blocks. And then you've got your units where there could be anywhere between two to five individual units on that site. Um, typically, there's still little to value add, in, excluding internal renovations because the land's already been optimized using most of that, um, that land. The next part is a lot of them still do come with body corporate fees. So that's something to be wary of. Um, even if they do offer slightly higher yields, those body corporate fees will eat into your cash flow on those properties. It's because again, they typically have low land to asset value ratio. Now the growth rates on your units, the long-term averages are about 50% less than your standalone home. So there can be anywhere between three to four and a half percent. That variance again is coming from the units versus the unit blocks. So it's again, another asset type we wanna move away from in the property space. Then we move to townhouses. So again, excluding the renovation, they still offer little value add to us. Again, they're on smaller parcels of land. So being able to do subdivisions, adding rooms, etc., it's not really available to us. Um, and I call them cheap imitations of standalone homes because they get all the nice looks and features. You might get a double story four and two on that townhouse. But again, a lot of the value is sitting in the asset and not in the land. As investors, we wanna move away from this. Your growth rates are still stronger than the other assets we've talked about so far. They'll typically be between about four to five and a half percent per annum, so not terrible, but they're not getting us exceptionally higher yields. They are sacrificing us on capital growth and they definitely don't have offer that value add potential. So it's again, another one, excluding if you wanna live in one, uh, I would be looking to avoid from a uh, investment perspective. Then we get into a really, I guess, a, a more popular one and growing in popularity at the moment is duplexes. So duplexes, you've got two properties, essentially Siamese twins properties almost joined together. Um, 
I guess they don't really have a lot of value add potential on those properties. The, the main way you manufacture your growth through a duplex is through strata titling. You've got two properties on the one block. You, co you create a subdivision on those properties and you know you might have say had that the two duplexes together potentially worth $800,000. You come in and do that subdivision and you've now got two properties worth $500 or $550,000. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as it may sound. You know, you can't just subdivide these properties that easily. You've got to put in fireproof walls and there's a lot of compliance and regulation, build time. So all these things come in at opportunity cost. If it's taking two years or 18 months, whatever it may be to build your duplex, you know, you are doing that at the expense of foregoing compounding capital growth potentially in another asset foregoing rental returns you may be paying in stages for your building development along the way with no rental income so so again for me that's a bit of a no-go down this type of asset also going to be in a rent heavy area and your growth again tends to be around that kind of townhouse um, area around that kind of four to five percent uh, mix so for me again okay plan in terms of if you want it for uh, higher yielding cash flow but it's really at it's it's a uh, not quite good enough on the yield, not quite good enough on the capital growth. I don't want something that's average or above average in two elements. I want something that's exceptional in one or both. So uh, that's a no for me. Then we go into commercial properties. Um, commercial properties is a very, very tricky one. You've got to almost time your way into a commercial property if you are going to go down that route because historically we're seeing yield compressions in the commercial front i'm seeing a lot of commercial properties now at around the six percent or less net yield mark and your interest rates are still quite uh, basically around that mark so they used to offer cash flow for a lot of them they're not, not even offering cash flow at the moment but some of the reasons why we look to avoid commercial property unless it's at the very end stage of our cycle which we get to later on in the strategy module is because you do have longer vacancy rate periods. So though you may have a tenant on board and that tenant might be on board for say 10 plus years without any vacancy, when they do exit the premise, you may be out of a tenant of that place for three, six months, maybe even more. So again, for, for someone who might be in the accumulation stage of building a portfolio, it's something we want to avoid. The second part we've got here is that capital growth is you know historically linked with your rental increase you know your commercial property is typically valued more like how a business is valued your business is typically got a cafe it's going to be the profit being earned from that cafe which is going to determine your valuation the same thing or the same principle i should really say applies for the commercial sector of where if you've got a property and it's increasing at say three four or five percent per annum which is the standard kind of range for your rental increases well that is typically going to be the rate of increase of which your commercial property is increasing. Now, there's lots of different types of commercial property. You've got uh, manufacturing facilities, childcare centers, retail, office spaces, myriads of different ways you can go down. But in general, that's the way you, you typically tend to value up. There can be some exceptions, people potentially rezoning or, or changing the type of industry that site is attracting. Potentially the zoning on the site changes as well, but we again talking about general uh, general terms here. Uh, the entry points for commercial property is the other big reason to avoid uh, at the beginning specifically because you typically need around that 20 to 30%, sometimes even 40% depending on the type of asset or where you're buying it. So it's a lot of capital to stump up, uh, particularly for an asset which in the current market today is not producing the income or after. And also the capital growth has never historically really been there. But again, um, the final one is the rents on your commercial property, typically serviced at a slightly lower level than residential. So your residential rent, you typically get about 80% of that income um, accepted for servicing by the banks. In the commercial setting, it's around about 75%. So again, another reason, um, if we were looking for more reasons to avoid it, then we've got one there. The next one here we've got is granny flats. So... I am, I guess, a big proponent against granny flats, particularly in the building stage, maybe at the back end of the stage, it makes sense. But the main reason is because firstly, they do not value up. So it's gonna cost you in the current market, 150, 200,000 to, to build a proper granny flat, you get your permits, you build all those kind of things in place. 
you're only typically going to see 50 to 60 percent of the valuation of that added back onto your home so what i mean by that is if you've spent that two hundred thousand dollars to to build the granny flat you might get a hundred to a hundred and twenty thousand of dollars of that added back into the home. So you've lost 80 to $100,000 in terms of equity position. Um, and you've created yourself a bit of a Frankenstein of a property. So you've changed the demand of your future buyers coming into that space. The people who are going to be interested in a property with a granny flat at the back are typically going to be investors, or they're going to be people living with older grandparents or older kids, maybe a uni student, late high school kid living in the back. Most people don't want a weirdo living in the back of their granny flat where their kids maybe want to play about. So you've got to understand it also changes the demand dynamic in terms of what buyer and renter may want that property. Um, and the building plans can be complex to navigate and costly. It really is more of a end of an accumulation phase strategy. So what I mean by that is somebody building up a property portfolio accumulated property after the property and potentially they've run out of servicing at this point, but they do still have access to capital. That is when your granny flat really comes into play. So that's when potentially you're going back to your existing portfolio and you're doing those granny flat builds then because you've got the capital behind you. Your focus now is on cash flow and you want to increase your cash flow and also increase your servicing. So for me, this is the pretty much the only time in the current market where the granny flat really stacks up. Then moving on to small uh, lot subdivisions. So again, I am talking about in general terms here, um, there is still profit to be made on some of these projects, more so in particular in your million dollar plus listed suburbs. The cost of subdivision and new build at the moment is higher than it's ever been and it's still trending to be much higher in terms of post COVID, so today's market to pre COVID, there's over a 50% increase in those um, in terms of costs. But this was actually a strategy we used to go down as a business. So the old battle axe, black, uh, battle axe block strategy, I should say, where you, you've got your large block, you've got your property at the front, you've got your subdivision at the back, you potentially renovate that front property, holds the value of what you initially bought that property for by doing that renovation you subdivide that land component and then you sell it off or you build on it um, in the current market it's not quite valuing up it may in the future it's something that we always want to revisit but um, guys there are professional developers in this space even clients that work with us in the advisory space that cannot turn a profit of this at the moment. And these are people who are doing this on a full-time basis. So if you are going to go down that route, you really make, need to make sure you do your due diligence and homework space. And also weighing up what is the cost of acquisition costing you? You know, what is the build time? What is the, uh, you know, the payments you're making along the way through the certain stages in terms of, you know, you do that, you get the foundation laid, you gotta pay your first and so on. All those things that you're going along the way, one, we've ran the numbers for clients, and I'm talking, we've helped hundreds and hundreds of clients, uh, me, me directly over the period of time. When I've ran the numbers in terms of feasibility on a lot of these plans versus just getting themselves into an established asset, the numbers just don't stack up. They're pretty much, even best case scenario, the subdivision maybe is on par but then we're fraught with all this risk along the way. We haven't got the rental income coming through where we're dealing with unknown commodities. For me, this is just something that is, again, more towards the higher price point properties. And again, doesn't, it's not just not valuing up at the moment. So it's something that I look to avoid at the moment with a lot of clients. Next part is land development. So if you're not familiar with land development, what we're talking about here is, you know, you're buying acreage, hectares and hectares of land potentially out in uh, somewhere and you're gonna look to develop it and turn it into a, a new little community. It might just be smaller development of 50 or 20 properties, whatever it may be. Um, but again, this one is more best reserved for the top end of town. And it either happens from kind of large corporation based setups or a pool, like almost like a share pooling of investors coming in and, and land banking all together now. Firstly, there is a lengthy planning process and, and development time that comes along in this sense. Um, professional developers still really don't make a lot of dollars on a lot of these projects. Some make a killing, but a lot do not. Um, again, when you're investing, it's all about risk mitigation. For me, risk mitigation 
is controlling the controllables. A project like this, unless you are a really high-end sophisticated investor and at this stage of your investing journey, uh, this is something that's, yes, one in a hundred times may fast track your journey, but 99 times out of a hundred, a lot of people either go sideways or set themselves up to go backwards for financial ruin. So for me, too much risk involved, too many uncontrollables, it's something that I would look to, to still steer well clear from. Next one again is also growing in popularity is NDIS and rooming houses. So this, these two are very hands-on assets. I think when a lot of people are getting themselves into property investing, they think of property investing in terms of it's being quite hands-off. You know, they can focus on their day-to-day, -day, their revenue generating through their jobs, working with their family, all of those kind of things which soak up most of our time. When you're getting into this kind of space, NDIS and rooming house, particularly rooming houses, um, you know, you're not, you know, it's almost like you're buying multiple properties at once. So though they absolutely can come with the benefits of higher yields, they also come with significantly higher management fees and significantly more wear and tear. And for me, again, controlling the controllables, the reason I tend to stay away from these types of properties is because you have a lack of control when it comes to picking your tenants. Um, in the NDIS space, unfortunately, um, it is a great initiative um, for the government and, these, and you know, people who are needing assistance should absolutely get this. But you're not controlling the tenant coming in. They're not people who would just have, say, wheelchair bound. Um, a lot of people have you know, psychological disabilities and, and have read online through the property investing forums a lot of, I guess, bad experiences and I guess destruction of property, etc. Also tenants canceling last minute, either falling ill, moving somewhere else, having long vacancy rates, etc. So that's something to consider in the NDIS space. And then on the rooming house space, um, again, not to stereotype people, but we're not getting five lawyers moving into these houses. Like we're getting five people that may be um, financially challenged, um, you know, and they're not five friends that are all going to get along with each other at any one time. So there can be, again, there's far more wear and tear, far more fees. Um, and I guess the big one for me is they don't value up very well. The, the bank valuer comes out and he values the property. Well, he's got next to no comparisons to really how to value this property when it comes appraisal time. He doesn't know how to value the five bathrooms sitting in that property because he's got nothing to compare it to. So if you're hoping one day to be able to really value this property up, extract equity, move from one property to the next, these type of assets are not going to do it for you. Yes, they may offer you a little bit of, of uh, cash flow at the beginning, but it's not going to expen exponentially grow over that period of time and you're going to get it stuck in this type of asset. Uh, so for me, again, this one's a bit of a no-go. Then we move into off-the-plan properties. Now, we've done a lot of content online. I believe Jacob's put a 45-minute video online in terms of why we look to, to do this. We've done a large case study of this, but I guess essentially when you're buying a property that's off the plan, you've always got the threat of new supply and there's lack of infrastructure in place. Uh, this is something I've personally experienced. I've built a home to live in in a house and land package area and seen it happen firsthand. Um, but that new supply is constantly throttling your capital growth along the way. Because why would somebody come along and buy your $500 or $600,000 property when they can go down to the land developer partner up with a builder and build a brand new home bespoke with all the government building packages and assistance there for them and get it built exactly to how they like. So for us, it's a bit of a no-go. And yes, they can come with depreciation and all these added benefits. But again, you're going to get back a percentage of your dollar that you're losing and you're foregoing capital growth in those early years. So it's normally around about the five to seven year period where you're getting outperformed by inflation. So you might only be getting two to 3% per annum in terms of growth. A lot of these properties are actually built at negative equity positions. So what I mean by that is you build a $400,000 home on a $300,000 block of land. That property is only worth $700,000 if it's in a $700,000 area. Most of the time these properties are in a 
500, dollars $600,000 home. So by the time the property is built and complete, you maybe could sell that property on market for $600,000, $650,000. You're at a negative equity point. So you're actually behind the eight ball should things go pear-shaped. Um, and then you're getting average growth. If you're foregoing 4% capital growth for the next seven years on a $500,000 asset, you're giving up a minimum $20,000 per year. So that's $140,000 of growth thrown out the door, all for a couple of grand <laughs> from your depreciation. It, for me, it's just, um, it's a bit of a no brainer looking to avoid these properties as well. These are almost as bad for me, not quite as bad, but as bad at the beginning as an apartment. Later on, they turn okay. After that, you're gonna get your average capital growth and things will, will be okay. But again, for me, it's a bit of a no go. And then we've got established property. So this is why we look to buy established property. So for me, established property is pretty simple. We're, we're looking for property that have a really high land to asset value ratio. We then want value add potential. So what does value add potential look like? So value add potential looks like to me, it's a cosmetic renovation today or in the future. It's a subdivision in the future or it's adding a granny flat in the future. We're not talking about today, but these properties have multiple strategies that can be applied to them over time. They're not tied to one strategy. And it's property investing is about creating options for you ultimately. If these properties have multiple options on them later on as well, we're not just talking about strategies for you to enact, it's also for a future buyer to enact as well. So again, we increase the buying pool. We're then buying in areas where land scarcity is already in play and infrastructure's in place. So people are wanting to come in and buy and live in these areas because the infrastructure's in place, but there's no land or free homes to be able to do that. So the demand is stronger than the supply. And then if we just look at the average capital growth rates on these properties, so we're talking about an average of 7.25% per annum. So this is vastly outperforming any other type of property asset class that we've talked about so far. And the next thing I want to talk to you about is the doubling of property prices. I'm just going to put you on to the next slide now. So when we look at this slide here, what we can see here, this is just comparing the growth and performance of property, established property over the last six decades. So we've essentially seen a doubling every eight and a half years over the long period of time. So for me, it's a pretty simple equation here. We need to pick the right property type even if we're going to get average results, I'd be more than happy with an asset doubling in value every eight and a half years, particularly if I've got strong leverage on that asset. So for me, the established property is a bit of a no brainer. I'm not paying for any building margin. I'm buying a property with high land to asset value ratio. What is important is that you get yourself educated. You can continue to watch the rest of the modules because if you're picking the right property, using the education or support, surrounding yourself really with an expert along the way or experts along the way to give you really great uh, great advice along the way. This is what performance can look like. So when we talk about performance here in an advisory level and, and here what we're talking about is hundreds and hundreds of purchases that we've done for clients along the way. So this is a, a bit over $1.3 billion worth of property purchased for clients year to date. We've essentially outperforming the market more than three to one in the average. So this is what's helping clients in an advisory level. They're not just buying one property, they're buying property two, property three, property four, etc., because they're getting properties that are getting them results and they're getting them results early. It's that compounding leverage that's helping them build their portfolio. If we take a look at the Kagar results, the actual five year rolling average is over 17% capital growth year on year. So this here is not just, uh, again, one or two property purchases that we're talking about. These are hundreds of, of property purchases here kind of outlined by the dots and, and outlining for the performance. But we're not just buying property for the sake of buying property. We can see over here in terms of when COVID uncertainty was going on, you know, we weren't exposing clients to risk. We assess the market and we make sure that we make really informed decisions because at that point, the asset types that we needed to target potentially could have changed. They didn't. But again, we needed to make sure we're, we're, that we're acting considered and we're making decisions made on clarity and making sure we continue to build our portfolio in a really well-structured manner. 
Thank you for watching today. We've got more coming through the next one. Jacob's gonna be running through the data tool and what are the real macro factors we want to be targeting when it comes to actual property selection and the area of selection. So make sure to watch that and please, if you have any feedback, leave some comments. Thank you.